Okay. All right, um, Michal, thank you so much for joining me here. Um, I'll just introduce you a little bit. Um, actually, I don't, I don't I have not actually, this is maybe our second conversation, uh, but um, we met because I, I wrote an article um, where, where I um, shared your video uh, in my name. I want no vengeance. And so Michal's um, son was murdered by Hamas on October 7th. And, um, you know, I had been speaking, I had written an article before that about, about uh, this has got to stop, you know, this, that, that the more killing justified by previous killing will just lock us in a forever cycle of more killing. And, but, you know, people said, well, Charles, that's easy for you to say, but if it had been your own family, then you would be calling for revenge, just like everybody else, you know, you're just shielded by your, by your fortune and privilege. So when I came across your video, Michal, um, it was very affirming to me, you know, because you had a right to say that, that maybe I didn't have, or at least an authority um, to call for an end to the cycle. And so I was very moved by that and I shared it. And so I guess I'll start by thanking you for, for having the courage to, to speak out and thanking also like whatever, um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll start with that as a, as a question unless there's something else you want to say first, but, um, you know, because many who were affected do, do, did call for revenge and revenge is being carried out right now. Um, so, so what moved in you or what spoke to you that you chose a different, a different path? Can, can, yeah. Um, sure. First of all, th I want to thank you for both sharing my video and for speaking to me now and sharing my voice. Um, so I've I've ne I've never believed in war. I I never understood it, and um, I don't know. Call me innocent, but. I, I never understood why people should ki kill each other to, to serve the leaders of their country and what is all this separation. I just don't understand it and I've never understood it. And, um, and then this, the most horrible thing that could happen to anyone happened, which is I lost my only son. And he wasn't a soldier. He wasn't fighting. He went out to dance in a festival with his friends and um, and never came back. And uh, the day I received the news of his death, of course, I was de devastated. The whole world just crashed in front of me and I crashed with it. And as I was yelling out to the skies and crying to the center of the earth, I met I met this huge light, which I I I won't say a lot about it because it was very sacred and very private between my son's soul and my soul. But what I will share about it is that in that moment, the whole world became silent and it was him and I. And in that moment, I realized there is something I need to tell the world because until that moment, I, I have lived my own very small private life on the edges of society. I've never 
come out to the front to to the to the light i've always been uh, somewhere just doing what i can to help raising my boy on love and feeling that if if i see people in pain or in need i will help them and that is what i did until october 7th i helped people heal their wounds and uh their uh emotional wounds i mean and and i've never been a public speaker i've never been an activist i just believed in this just do good wherever you are and and that that's that's how we heal the world and this whole i i've i can't even believe that we met that darkness that my son and i had my son i haven't met the darkness i can only imagine what happened to him but i lost him to that darkness and um and and i felt like i heard a message from him his name is laor which means to the light and it feels like he's showing us the way showing me the way and asking me to show it to the world and at uh I, probably the next day i was uh sitting at his father's house and hundreds of people were coming there to to the shiva to to hug us and to be with us and and people were showing us uh, a photo of uh, a missile 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 sorry mm -hmm. still not that perfect saying in the memory someone wrote on it in the memory of laor abramov which is my son's name and this this missile was sent out to gaza to kill <laughs> And I couldn't bear it. I couldn't bear someone putting my son's name on a killing machine. And then I realized I, I immediately, out of my own wreckage and devastation and from my tears in my bed, I just got up and, and took a video of me asking the world, stop this. I can't imagine another single mother going through what I'm going. And I know everyone is going through their own grief, but I, there's just no point in this. I, I don't believe in that. And I feel like there's um, the rage that people feel is is what leads them to this violence, to the to this darkness, to this hatred. And I truly believe that underneath all rage and anger lies deep pain and fear. And we can work with pain and fear. We can't do anything with anger, but hurt more people. <laughs> So that is mostly what I, what led me to this video, because I couldn't bear the thought that, especially not in my name and in my son's name, someone would go out and kill more people, and then they will kill more people, and just all this hurting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could imagine, you know, one of the relatives of one of the children who's died in Gaza, writing his name on a missile, you know, and sending it somewhere else. And then someone else innocent will get in, you know, this is how it's happened for really thousands of years. Yes. Yeah. And maybe the time has come for it to stop. You know, maybe like after, after the attacks and when I saw the responses, I, I fell into a very intense depression. Um, just seeing it, the whole thing happening again. And I was like, haven't we learned? Haven't we learned? What will it take for us to learn? And the, um, but you know, maybe the fact that this is at the forefront of our uh, 
global consciousness right now, it's in it, everybody's paying attention to it. You know, at least everybody has an opinion or people who had no opinion on, you know, Yemen, you know, or uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, or any of these other places where horrible things have been happening, maybe in sheer numbers to more people than are happening, than's happening in Israel and Palestine. Um, they weren't paying attention to that, but now it's in the forefront of our consciousness and we're getting maybe an opportunity to make a clear choice to, to, cause it's put it in our, in our face for us to say yes or no to. And that, so I, I draw some hope from that. Um, and, and from my friend, you know, I, I, so when, when I was, you know, in the midst of this anguish, I, um, I, I, spoke to my friend Orland Bishop, who's uh, a very, very wise human being. Because um, I was just in anguish. And he said, he said, no one ever dies in vain. These people who are, and this was before the um, invasion of Gaza, you know, before a lot of the retaliation had, had, had started, but it had just it was just starting. Um, and he, he, so he, so I said, you know, so many are about to die. And he says, nobody ever dies in vain, that this is potentially an initiation for the whole planet, uh, because it is so visible, you know, because it is at the forefront of consciousness and it means that we have an opportunity to honor those who died by making sure that it does not happen again. Like in a sense, that's what they died for so that it won't happen again. So that we hold life sacred and put that above being right you know i just wrote another essay a couple days ago called every war is justified because somebody's justifying it you know so it is justified in people's minds and and because people usually use when they say something's justified they're saying well in some objective sense this is right to kill because of this reason, this reason, and this reason. So what they're doing is an act of justification. Every war, every war, there's somebody justifying it. Every killing, there's somebody justifying it. Which means, in my mind, that the problem is justification. Which means to make it right in your mind. To make it right. Everybody has a way to make it right to kill. And... You know, maybe sometimes if you agree with the premises, maybe it is right. You know, you can make all kinds of reasons why it's right. But I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in what's right. I'm interested in, you know, a mother trying to dig her child out of the rubble of a destroyed building with her hands because she has no tools. You know, I'm 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 interested in in the 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 whimpers of children and the cries of mothers and the, the wailing of brothers and sisters and parents you know like <laughs> can't we be there you know and if the deaths of all of these people can bring us there then they will not have died in vain It's as a mother of of one who has died, it's so hard to understand that. Um, but yes, I don't know about if they died for it or no. I mean, I'm not communicating directly with God in order to know that. 
but I feel that you are right about this coming up to the front stage that no one has, is left without a side or an opinion. And if it's okay, I'd like to, to share something that happened to me last week. Mm. I have a friend who, who lives, she's not from Israel. She was in Israel. She has two children with an Israeli uh, um, man and they left Israel and moved to, to back to the States. And her children were very close with my son when they were living in Israel. And um, when my son uh, died, she wrote a beautiful eulogy and um, and how close they were all were with us and how they love him and love me and all of that. And, um, and then she started posting her pro pro-Palestine in that case, flags and essays and opinions. And, um, and, and I told her, uh, I thought you were my sister. I'm not putting a pro-Israel flag on my profile. I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm laying the flag down and I'm asking you as my friend to lay your flag down and, and converse with me and hear my heart and maybe we can, just the two of us, between us, find a way to be together in this horrible disaster that has happened to me, to us, to, to your children. Their grandparents are still in Israel. And by you supporting one side, you are flaming flames of hatred. And... I, I begged for her heart. I begged her to speak to me and just lay down the flag and talk to her sister. We were very close before that. And mm. I have never engaged in any political discussion. And I, I don't do that. But because she was her friend, my friend, I asked her, can we please talk? Can you please just maybe find in your heart a place for a third option, which is not pro this side or pro this side. You are not, your children are sleeping safe in their beds in your house. Now, you have, that, you have that gift that your children are still with you. Please listen to me. I'm not talking opinions with you. I'm begging for your heart. This is how we will heal the world. And, and I was attacked by her. I, I, as I grieve my, 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 my son who just lost his life. And I, you know, at that point, I, I thought I might find some anger inside of me and say, oh, okay, let's cancel her. Let's dismiss her. Let's. I couldn't find it because it hurt me more mm -hmm. to fight her back. It hurt me more to prove my point. It hurt me more to be right. Mm -hmm. I just wanted closeness and love with this human being who I know personally. She's not even a stranger. And this is what leaves me even more brokenhearted than I am that people just cling to one opinion or to one side and say, I'm right. This is me. We're the good ones. You're the bad ones. This land is mine. This land is yours. The, the whole separation is, I, I, I truly don't understand it. I was just thinking, you know, if there was an alien invasion, then no one would care about if you're Jewish or Muslim or Buddhist. We would all unite in front of in in front of our new enemy. So why wait for for more disasters, and why separate ourselves? And why? I I really, you know, I talk to people because in Israel. Um, the people who know me and know my approach, they support and love me. But I had some 
really, really, really hurtful responses about my video because mm. people here in Israel believe that we need to, there's no one to talk to and there's no one to, their, their side, they have, they, they teach their children to hate and it's true. They teach their children to kill and hate and not see Jewish people as human beings. I I believe that the soul the the they're not soldiers the terrorists believed that they are not killing human babies. I I I think I don't know I really don't know what happened there and I can't know what they thought but I understand that people think that the other side is not worth and that the other side is not worth being called human. But a Palestinian mother who gives birth to a baby, to a soft baby, I believe a hundred percent, she doesn't want that baby to be killed or to kill or to hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the answer. Mm -hmm. I think everyone who is not in the conflict should find, and that was that's what I was trying to ask that friend of mine. You are out of the conflict. Your children are safe with you. Instead of putting all that power and energy into more hatred, do the opposite. Put everything you can into listening to someone who's hurting. Put all your energy into being with that person. You know, when, when you work with children and they fight over a toy. So he's right because it was his toy and he's right because he saw it first or whatever. But then you love those little children and you listen to them and you talk to them and you give them their space and you teach them to see each other and you teach them that... Maybe they can play together with that toy. Maybe they take turns or whatever. But you see, this is a child and this is a child. You don't take a side. And I feel this is all that is being asked here is that we stop taking sides and that we love everyone who has any power in them, use it for love. Mm -hmm. Raise the new children in this world on love and heal the mothers, and heal the fathers, and, you know, I'm not innocent, I know that horrible things have happened, I, the most horrible thing in the world has happened to me, my boy, my love and light, my hope in this world, I have not had an easy life, and I put all my hope into a future, because I had a child, and I am left a childless mother now with nothing to do but keep on loving him. I, I have nothing else to do here but keep this love alive. Otherwise, there is no, I, I understand. I understand that, that, that violence has been the answer for too many years, but we must find a way. We must find a way to teach love, to put all the world's, if all the world will just stop everything they do, and instead of putting all that energy into, into more weapons and more hatred and teaching the children to hate and, and people that don't even understand what they're saying, yell out in the streets on both sides, I'm not talking only on one side, speaking hate on both sides and teaching them love and sitting with them. That would, I I have to believe that would save the world because otherwise what, what can we do here? Aren't there enough disasters and diseases and accidents that we yeah. lose each other for? Yeah. Yeah, even if even if we weren't harming each other, there would still be plenty of tragedies in this world without us adding more to them. 
the the um this this taking sides that you were talking about you know with your friend um i was thinking taking sides provides some relief like a temporary relief from the pain from the anguish from the bewilderment you know from from that the feeling that 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 you were describing of just this perplexity how can people do this how can people do this like it just doesn't make sense you know it's it, it it's it's um it's hard to even to really even feel that and to feel the 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 pain of all that's happening and and the the hopelessness of it ever stopping and so one way to exit that feeling is to take a side and along with that side comes a story that if our side wins then it won't happen anymore and that we will impose good and right and justice onto the world and and we will solve all of the problems because good will win because we're good and they're evil and so it's a it's an off ramp from feeling what's actually true and when you challenge that you're you're taking away it's like taking away somebody's drug you know it's like taking away somebody's alcohol uh you're you're threatening that whole narrative in which everything is okay as long as we win and here is the plan here is the plan the plan is that good defeats evil in a war and and so you're by by speaking for peace and saying no no more war no more taking sides show me your heart by saying that you are a bigger threat to them than even the enemy is the enemy validates that story by their existence and the the worse the enemy is the better the better the more comforting it is ah see we are right we are good they are wrong they are evil and you're you are um I think maybe one reason that people sometimes react violently to your peace offerings is that you are threatening that whole setup. Um, but then there are those many, many who um, are ready, who are sick of this, um, who sense on some level the futility of the cycle of hate and vengeance and um and maybe they just need a little a little nudge you know a little permission and if you say it one who has lost everything then they know that it's okay for them to feel it too and that's why i keep saying what i have to say even though it's very painful for me to stand here and continue speaking instead of crawling back into my grief yeah but but I feel that, that I owe it to my son. And I I can't live in a world where this voice isn't as loud as can be. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I really... I understand that... that this is a new option for people and it's too threatening. I understand that. But you know, in a war, there, there are never winners. No one wins a war, ever. 
You can't win a war. I, I can't imagine someone who has been killing other people and being okay with it and, and feeling feeling like they want something. I can't I can't believe a world where using your power to more destruction leaves you in a, a feeling of winning. It's just there there aren't any winners in a war. Never. Yeah. You know, uh, there have been very few American casualties in our recent wars. But you know what's killed more American soldiers than the enemy is suicide. Right. Yeah. And and for every suicide, there's 100 cases of depression and PTSD. Um, and that just illustrates how you know, what you do to the other, you end up doing to yourself. And, you know, we could make political statements about that, about, um, I mean, I talk about that from the point of view of my country all the time, you know. Yeah, we've visited much violence on the rest of the world and have not really been attacked, but the violence comes in anyway, domestic violence. You know, violence in the streets, violence in the schools, violence in the home. You can't keep it out. And um, that's, uh, you know, my, my, my writing, my philosophy has been about separation. That's been the main theme of, of all of my writing for 20 years. Uh, and, and the illusion that I'm separate from you. In that illusion, what I do to you, it doesn't have to happen to me. What we do to the Palestinians, what we do to the rainforest, what we do to, to the babies, what, you know, well, that's them and this is me. So it doesn't have to affect me. But the transition that we are in right now is into a new story that understands that we're not really separate, that what happens to anybody in some way happens to me as well, in some form, that what we do to the planet, we do to ourselves, that what we do to the enemy, we do to ourselves, that we're inseparable because we're not just these separate selves. And there, that, that we are mysteriously and intimately connected with each other on an existential level. You know, it's not just that we're related, but we are our existence is connected. Um, and, and all of our divisions fall short of the truth. And maybe, you know, maybe in, in your experience um, that you spoke of at the beginning, um, the spiritual experience of connecting with your son on a soul level, um, like maybe that, that um, you know, reminded you um, on the body level of, of the truth of non-separation. I like to call the coming times the age of reunion, where we begin to um, step by step uh, return to the truth of interbeing, interexistence. And... Uh, Sometimes I, I uh, you know, just lose faith, you know, and I and I forget that it's possible when when there's a big setback or what seems like a setback. You know, that's that's what happened for me after October seventh. I was like, oh, maybe we're not on the road. Maybe we're not on the healing path after all. You know, maybe it's just going to spin worse and worse and worse.
And that's why your video was was so helpful to me, actually. Um, you know, it 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 showed me you no know, the return, the reunion is it is happening. Yeah. Yeah, all you can say to that is amen. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I hope so. And it is a very, very, very dark and difficult time now. Um, but I keep, for some reason, I keep seeing that light, my son's light. I keep seeing him show us the light. That's his name, to the light. Mm -hmm. Can you say his name again in, in Hebrew? It's Laor. Or, La or. or means light and Laor to the light. Um, mm -hmm. When he was born, I thought it had a different meaning, but he's bringing light into the life, into his life. Mm -hmm. um, after uh, hard and, and very painful times in in our lives here and and now it got a whole new meaning um but i i truly believe that love is the answer towards what you're saying to that reunion that by that we manage to listen to each other and feel compassion to each other and love ourselves and our neighbors. And then more, mm -hmm. and then more, and then more. That's the only thing. Just go back to loving, go back to loving wherever you can. Mm -hmm. um, and all the rest is just scenery. And and I want to to add if I can that I I I want to repeat that I think or I believe or I feel I don't even know how to say it that everyone who has the privilege to do something needs to put all their energy into loving and into teaching love and into healing where it hurts so that there will be more space in our hearts to love because the opposite of love is fear and pain and that leads to all the horrible things that we have experienced and when you feel when when you feel love, it heals all the rest. And and if there's something I, I want to ask the world is if your loved ones are with you, put your energy into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When when people describe their um yeah, I have, I have a I know a guy who um had a near death experience um he was in a a deep coma you know um i mean his heart had stopped and then he was in a deep coma and he came back weeks later um from that and he described his experience uh drew brophy his name is um i maybe i'll, I'll share the video uh but he um you know when he had his life review, um, he said, yeah, the, the, and those at that moment, the only thing that you care about is, is those who you loved. And, and like, that's the only thing that matters. You know, how did I, how did I relate to those I loved? Everything else falls away. 
And if we could, uh, like the relationships are what's important, you know, and, and if we could take that wisdom, you know, that's transmitted from people who have had those experiences or transmitted from people like you who have, who have, you know, faced, I mean, what you have also is kind of like a death experience, you know, it, it just obliterates everything that isn't true, everything that's not actually important. And it reveals the truth, which is love. And if we can, if we can receive some of that, I, I guess I'm just um, asking everybody listening to take a few moments to really receive that and to recognize the truth of what Michal is saying. Just recognize that truth and, and it will never let you go. And um, yeah, so just returning your uh, amen with a with a second one. And wow, yeah, <laughs> you know, I write, I, uh, I speak also of the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. And the only way to get there is like what you're saying is is love. And it's so easy to do. It's <laughs> easy to do. It's so much easier than all the rest. It's just looking at someone and feeling feeling them and looking yeah. at them, listening to them and sitting with them and then asking them, what do you need? How do you feel? Tell mm -hmm. me more. I'm here for you. I'm sorry you're hurting. That's it. So easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any, any, um, any, any final thing that you would like to share with people? Um, just go find someone to to sit with and listen to today and tomorrow, every day. Find someone hurting and listen to them. And if you're hurting, find someone that will listen to you. Mm -hmm. That's really everything that I'm asking for. And if you do have that privilege of not being in distress at the moment, spread love. Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for allowing me to speak here and for making this happen and hearing me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Michal. Um, and any time that you have, um, um, you know, any request of me or anything that you want to uh, communicate um, to the people who read and listen to my, my words, then you know, then please, please, please just tell me and I will do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and thank you everybody for listening. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to staying in touch with you. Yeah. Thank you.